the um thank you there we go i'm sorry i'm assuming you don't want me to repeat my whole no okay good just checking so um yeah the moment i found out that its future appeared to be in peril i began looking into historic landmarking as a way to preserve this site and pave the way for it to hopefully be taken over by someone who will continue to run it as a business if indeed a change of hands is what is in the future for this place and even if that's not what's going on formally protecting it is a really good idea because you know as we all know real estate is at a premium here in california um history is being encroached upon from all directions and we really don't have a lot of places like this left so i've been working on putting together a historic landmark application for walkers it was already designated as an eligible site by the city's office of historic resources a number of years ago they do this thing called survey la where they go through historic properties and look at what appears to be eligible for designation. So it's already on their radar as being a significant spot. So this has a real chance of succeeding. Um, but a really important part of the landmarking process is getting the community involved and getting people aware of what's going on and showing that there is a lot of love and support for this place and that people want to see it stay around. Um, I started a petition, which in just two weeks has almost 1700 signatures, which is really pretty good. Um, but obviously as a neighborhood council of, or as the, the joint neighborhood councils, we you know represent all of San Pedro. So that has a lot of weight to it. And um, you know what we do matters. Um, and we have an opportunity, I think, to you know take a stance on this and to show support um, for you know, what is a very special place and what is also kind of, you know, like it's emblematic of a lot of the kind of battles that are being fought in Los Angeles at the moment in terms of, you know, we all, there are things that we need to catch up with, you know, the 20th century and where we're at, but it's also just so important to preserve the places that are our living links with the past. So I just think that's a really important thing to be aware of. So that said, um, I prepared a support letter, um, which would be the letter going out from the individual neighborhood councils in support of the landmark application. Um, Diana, do you want me to go ahead and share my screen? Sure, go ahead. So that we can all have a look at it. Um, hang on, I'm to figure out how to do that. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. You might have to give me privileges that I don't currently have. I have to make you a co-host. There we go. Okay. okay. And, I'm going and if not, one of us can share it. But yeah. We go. Yeah, I made one small tweak to it since drafting it. Okay. So. Um, but yeah, so this would be a letter to go out to the um, Cultural Heritage Commission. That's the first step in the process of submitting a landmark application is the Office of Historic Resources creates a staff report that goes to the Cultural Heritage Commission, um, who are the first round of decision makers. It sort of goes through three different stages. Um, so this is the first one. So it would be a letter that would go out to them, it would go out to uh, members of staff within the Office of Historic Resources, and it would also go out to CD15, because ultimately the local, the local council has a really big say in how these things go, and keeping them in the loop and making them aware of how people are feeling about this is kind of a key step of the process. So with that, thank you, Emma. Um, I'm going to um, move for Northwest, because I see we do have a quorum. Um, I'm going to remove, move approval for by Northwest of this letter. I'll second that. Second. I heard Linda first, so <laughs> Linda's the second. Um, and I will call, any, any discussion from Northwest before I call vote on it? Okay, hearing none. Linda Alexander? Yes. Um, Diana, yes. Dan? Yes. Uh, Pat Nave? Yes, but I did have my hand up. I'm sorry? He had his hand up. Do we need, do you need to say something before we finish voting? I'm going to try to do this in, in 15 seconds or less. 
Jason Herring and I had a wonderful conversation, at least I thought it was wonderful, about uh, his ideas about uh, places uh, in pocket, pocket areas to uh, be able to have a snack and spend some time would be wonderful enhancements to our public spaces, particularly our parks and buildings. Um, he, he really mentioned uh, Point Herman Park several times in our conversation as a place where you could could sit outside and have a uh, a bite or something, uh, watch the sunset. Uh, and this kind of fits in that plant panoply. And I'm hoping that he uh, will bring forward for all the neighborhood councils a kind of a a movement in that direction for other places uh, in and around San Pedro Peck Park and uh, is one and uh, a couple of other places too. So this fits right in with all of that. Okay, so with that, I will continue the voting. Pat? Yes, I said. You did say yes, okay. Chuck Hart? Yes. Uh, Jason Herring? Yes. And Alec Norman? Yes. So unanimous for Northwest. Should I ask, did I miss anybody that I didn't see? No, but Diane, I wanted to speak on this. Linda? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, what I wanted to mention was, first of all, a pride of uh, the central San Pedro is that Emma is on our board. And it's quite yeah. remarkable that um, she, I don't think she's been in San Pedro much more than a year and has, has this enthusiasm for our community. It was very exciting. Uh, but the other thing is she, she's looking for people who have pictures of the cafe um, they may only be in the background, and um, she's reached out to several places. I'm trying to get uh, some of the older folks groups uh, to respond. It's a real challenge because uh, they're not meeting in person. So mm -hmm. um, it's just any, you know, as you walk around and talk, uh, you know, ask people that you meet, do they have any any pictures that might include walkers, which would be very helpful in, uh, for Emma to develop her, um, her, her package to submit. Yeah, thank you, Linda, for bringing that up. It's basically having not just current, but also historic photographs of a proposed landmark is really important. And that's been, it's been tricky because I, I have, I have newspaper, extensive newspaper coverage. Walkers has featured in a lot of papers over the years, but that really only started to take off in the 70s. And I'm really hoping that I can find pictures that go back even earlier than that. And I know they have to be around somewhere. I know somebody's going to have them in their attic or on their hard drive, but it's just a matter of getting, reaching people. So if anybody has any leads, I would be very grateful indeed. Do you mind if I share a screen? And James Kempel has his hand raised. Oh, yes. Change. Oh, hang on. Do I need to stop screen sharing? Yes. I can I can stop it. I'll just click. Yeah. Well, we had a hand from uh, Tim Pompo. This okay. is on the topic of pictures. So before we move on, um, I just did a quick okay. search on I just did a quick search on um, Google Images and Here's one with a red car in front of Walker's. So I had that picture, but unfortunately, that's not the current Walker's building. That's the grocery store that was on that site previously until 1935. Uh, so I've already got, it's still valuable because it shows the development of that area. And actually that arch that you see on the facade that was incorporated into the interior of Walker's that's now above the bar. Uh, but I'm really hoping for pictures from like the 50s and 60s. Like it started, Walkers became Walkers in 1946. So I'm really hoping for things from kind of the first two or three decades of its life. What, what was it called before Walkers? Do you know? It was called Cuddles or Cuddle Cafe. Huh. Apparently, apparently it was a real dive. Um, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't found any pictures from that. Huh. As opposed to that. <laughs> Frank, um, does the wow. Historical Society might have anything? Uh, they might have pictures in the archives. I have, I have every jug from the archives has pretty uh, much. We have a repository of pictures, and I'm sure we have some. We have some there. Uh, yeah, that she could make use of it. You know. Yeah, I mean, Doug's been really. Doug I just don't know what's been really helpful. 
but he, he, they don't have anything going back that far either. Oh, you met okay. with Mona, didn't you? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So Frank, she's already met with Mona. Mm. Okay. Um, I uh, recognized Javier. Yes. Um, yes, thank you, Emma, for doing this. And uh, uh, as a stakeholder and longtime resident, uh, I do support it. Um, probably also equally because it would save development of apartment buildings there if this place was there. Um, I'm a little, uh, um, I've always heard if the present owners ever sell, the, uh, the beer and wine license would not be transferable. So I don't know if it does uh, change hands. Uh, this is just for point of information. Also, Greg Smith 30 years ago told me what was really interesting about uh, uh, Walker's Cafe was the building behind it, the, the big uh, or the garage, but it's a kind of a small warehouse, that that was actually the red car maintenance building. And that should probably be included uh, in Walker's because heck, you know, uh, uh, so I don't know when you're doing your research or would you include that garage? Speaking of which, it's been in trouble with all the stuff in back and in Facebook have been pasting and neighbors have been pasting, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, posting, sorry. Um, problems with, uh, there's just a huge mess behind in the alley behind walkers. And uh, a lot of neighbors have been just added in the uh, Point Furman Neighborhood Watch Facebook. Uh, there was a lot of postings there. So you might, I don't know, be aware of that. Um, so they're after that. I saw uh, with that. But uh, hopefully you can include the uh, maintenance building with that because that would be very cool. Yeah. Very so cool. it's, a, yeah, I can, I can maybe briefly speak to that. It's really interesting. So this, um, there's this, deep-seated belief in San Pedro that the building and indeed the sheds in the back have something to do with the uh, red car line. And I've, I've researched this very thoroughly. I was just on the phone earlier today for about 40 minutes to the archivist at the Southern California Railroad Museum in Paris. Wow. Um, fact checking some stuff with him. And at this point that I pretty much, I can confidently say that that was not the case. Um, the walkers, the, the front, the, the, the little cafe is, uh, is a 1935 building that streetcar had stopped running in 1934, but even before that, that site and the sheds, there is, there's no real link other than clearly people associated in their minds with the day when the trolley ran and that kind of nostalgic feeling for those early days of Point Furman. But it was actually the grocery store was owned by the Landier family um, and the sort of family patriarch Felicia Landier, he headed up the San Pedro Motor Bus Company. So they had a fleet of jitneys and later buses. They were pretty much the Pacific Electric's direct competitor. And as a matter of fact, ultimately succeeded in running them out of town because the bus <laughs> took over. So, <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, I mean, that, that all will go into the application because that's... <clears throat> Landier at the time was pretty much a big shot like that was a he was a you know he was a big he was a big deal and the fact that he he managed to sort of corral what was a very unregulated industry of kind of jitney drivers who are all doing their own thing and competing with each other and managed to sort of combine them into a company so yeah that that's a kind of significant chapter in early San Pedro history um as for the liquor license I've I've heard people say those things before. I'm not a restaurateur, so I cannot speak confidently to what would happen if that were to change hands. But um, there are some kind of, my impression is, is that there's been some kind of defeatist myths surrounding a place that's been in the same hands for so long, potentially changing over. That certainly happened in lots of other places before and it hasn't affected continuity. Um, it's been, it's also like, it's not, People will say like, oh, I don't know if you could still get a liquor license so close to a public park, stuff like that. Um, I can think of other sites that do have that. Also, it's just, they basically just serve beer. Like it's pretty, it's a pretty civil place. It's not a sort of nightlife venue. So personally, I don't anticipate any issues, but again, I can't, that's all for the future. At the moment, the main priority is just making sure that that place gets to remain alive and remain what it is. Thank you, Emma. Um, anybody else has any comments? 
Pat has his hand up. I don't know if it's, she just didn't take it down or it's another comment. Uh, yes, I wanted to respond to Emma's uh, request for photographs. The Port of Los Angeles over at uh, Birth 161 at the, uh, what's called the Yard, has an ex ex really expensive photo file going back to the 1860s, actually, last slides and so forth. And I, I also want to follow up with uh, James Campo's comment about it being somehow associated with the rail lines because um, one of the big title companies, and I, I used to know it off the top of my head, I can't remember which one it is, has an incredible photo file, but and it focuses a lot on uh, rail properties uh, and you're likely to find uh, lots of uh, uh, rail photos there. And, and I've seen a lot of them from San Pedro including one of the rail car, you know, the trolley uh, derailed uh, during uh, a visit by, a pres I think it was President Taft, so in San Pedro. So um, those are two, two uh, resources. And I'm thinking, you know, God bless the Paris uh, Railroad Museum people, but I, I wouldn't uh, rule out that there was probably some activity having to do with the uh, trolleys and so forth in that uh, shed back there being the end of the line kind of. So um, don't, don't uh, rule it out entirely yet. When you, think, I, when you think of that, Pat, we can send her the, the link to the, yeah. the title company you're talking about. Yeah, okay. that would be that would be great. I mean, I can't rule it out 100% because when you're doing archival research, you could never run, rule anything out completely. But I have seen deeds, I've also seen deeds for the property going back to when George Peck first sold it. And there's nothing there that attests to any relationship between it and the Pacific Electric. And that would have been, there would be some remaining paperwork because the Pacific Electric kept a pretty thorough administration. So there's just like, there's no record that points in that direction whatsoever. You may find that uh, there, there are a set of rail, uh, rail line uh, uh, deed documents that the rail, railroad has, and I think the port has them because I had them at one time for a project I was working on for a very long, long time there. <laughs> and um, if the railroad touched anything, it shows on those maps. Right, yeah, I have seen it. I, I've seen some of those maps where it basically goes right past the front of Walker's and it terminates pretty much kind of where the lighthouse is just on what is now Paseo del Mar. Um, mm -hmm. So I've seen maps where you can see like exactly like how the tracks were laid, including through what is now Sunken City. Um, but again, like it goes, it, it goes past the building at the street level, but the, the back doesn't really factor into that route in any way. The, mm -hmm. uh, in the lower parts of those maps, did you see lines and lines and lines of deed data um, showing the basis for um, claims on on the lines and the surrounding property, including their width. Um, I can I cannot remember off the top of my head what the the, the map I have is. I would have to have a look at it. Um, I'm happy to send. I am happy to send it over to. It would be really interesting to see if you've seen any maps I haven't seen. That would well, be delightful. Yeah. Those things are like three foot by four foot, quite big. Uh, anyway, yeah. I, I just. I like it, you know, I like it because I like it because it, the the addition of the rail sort of things to your to the to the uh, application I think gives it a lot of weight. But, uh, <laughs> maybe literally. <laughs> but it's uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean it's definitely it's just merely the fact that it is associated with, you know. There would never have been a grocery store there if it wasn't for the streetcar. When you start to look at how the neighborhoods in Los Angeles developed, you really start to see how the moment the trolley comes in, it's like, oh, now we need, you know, a place to get a bite to eat when we get off the trolley. And it's kind of cool because you can really see how the city was shaped and walkers and all of its history. Like that's one of the few places we have that kind of tells that story. So that's definitely a big part of the what makes it relevant and important. Mm -hmm. transit oriented development before that was a thing yeah <laughs> yeah basically yes so doug epperhardt has his hand up the shed looks really small to me i don't think you could put a red car in it 
<laughs> Let me know when you're ready for me, Diana. Go ahead, Doug. All righty. I've actually been in that building behind walkers. I don't know if anybody else has, but I have. It Nothing to do with red cars. Um, there is an inspection pit in the building where obviously you could pull a vehicle in there and go down underneath it. And I'm guessing it was probably those jitney buses. That makes sense, yeah. Yes, I know. Have any of you ever been in there, back in there? Um, some years, probably six years ago, believe it or not, when we were doing a neighborhood council election, we threw a party in that backyard and cleaned it all up. Obviously our work was for naught, um, but <laughs> I, at that point, I did get to go in that building and take a look at it. Um, there was never any kind of railroad track. There was just a single track that ran down Paseo Del Mar. And once Sunken City started to sink, which was actually, I want to say, 1927, 28? 29, yeah. Yeah, okay. I know it was late 20s. Those those rail lines were defunct at that point. Right. Um, but... You know, I've been a member of the National Trust for Historic Preservation for something like 30 years. And I have seen incredible buildings in Pedro just torn down and taken away. And we've lost a lot. Recently, we lost a house at 23rd and Gaffey, an old Spanish colonial. It's probably going to be a big, ugly apartment building or something. Um, this is important. I mean, I would really love to see maybe this is the start of a movement for historic preservation in San Pedro. Um, you know, recently, and Dan Dixon and I have talked talked about this, the renovations going on at San Pedro High School. San Pedro High School is a landmark building designed by an architect, Gordon B. Kaufman, who did the LA Times building in Hoover Dam. So, I mean, we have some incredible architecture, a Frank Gehry building in the aquarium at Cabrillo. I mean, that should be landmark. So anyway, um, this is good stuff and I look forward to its success. As long as Joe Buscano doesn't decide it needs to be like a six story luxury, <laughs> you know, apartment where people can look down in Noel Gould's backyard. Thank you, Doug. And I'm, I'm going to follow up with you uh, via email about that inspection pit thing, because that's really interesting. And I would like to mention that in uh, the landmark application. Okay, sure. Very good. Um, I guess um, if we don't have any further questions, um, maybe I could get um, a motion from Central uh, Committee to get a vote on this. I move. Move that we support Emma's letter. Can I get a second? I'll second. Very well. Um, we'll take a vote. Uh, Linda? Yes. Uh, Frank? Yes. Very well. And myself? Yes. Thank you. And that way we are able to bring it up to the next agenda meeting and bring it up to the, the next board meeting before our own meeting because we're not having one this month. So that gets us ahead of the game. Emma, you're welcome to join our committee. We have room. <laughs> we <laughs> like your spirit. I, I very likely will. I've been I've been holding off on committing to another committee, but it seems I'm I'm involved in land use whether I like whether I like it or not. So <laughs> that, that would be great. a great addition. You'll probably be seeing more of me. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. I think it's a really good resource on historical information too. So, you know, it'd be great to kind of bring that around and, and definitely we need that in town. We've been talking about it for some time. There's a lot of really good buildings that need to be protected. So what if, thank what you. If we, what if we wanted more than you do? What's that, Pat? What if we <laughs> wanted more than you do? Can we? <laughs> remember the board, Pat. <laughs> all right very well um do not have anybody from coastal so well coastal has three people here which is all they need but they don't really have a chair or a vice chair here yeah, I, I, I think it would be 
better for us to wait until we okay. have okay. Chair, vice chair. No problem. Yeah, I think um, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, anything from Tim, Diana? Yeah, Tim's here. I'm I'm on, but let's do a let's do a mic check. I'm on my phone. How's that sound now? Sounds great. So far, so good. Oh, good, good. Take it from, take it from the top. <laughs> okay, I will, I will take it from the top. Thanks very much, uh, Tim McCosker, Alta C at the Port of Los Angeles. Um, as of today, I'm the CEO. I was giving you some dramatic news that was uh, that was probably uh, uh, interrupted with my connection. So what I have, uh, I have uh, just recently uh, sat with the board and submitted my resignation to the board, uh, effective uh, early part of next month, uh, just a couple of days into the new year. I'm going to move over to as a uh, volunteer senior advisor to all the state to free my time for another activity in my life. And we are very fortunate at all to see that um, a someone that I've worked with on and off over the years, really over 20 years, uh, going back to the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger administration, uh, Terry Tamanen, who was the secretary under the governor for um, environmental resources and uh, uh, the EP, basically the EPA in California, uh, Terry Tamanen is going to be the CEO of Alta C effective January 1. He's already on board as a consultant and he'll just switch over then. So that is the big news. And then there's another piece of big news that came out two days ago that I will refer to in my slides. So if we could go to the top slide, that would be great. Jason, if you will. And I apologize everyone for the uh, quality of this phone. It's the, this season is full of so many meetings and so many activities. <laughs> okay, so it's been, a, it's been a little while since I've, since I've presented to you, but you see uh, all to see at the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, for those of you who, if there's anyone who hasn't heard some parts of this presentation, we are in the lower left quadrant of this scene. We are 35 acres of wharf land and water. You see the very long building there that's uh, that's in the middle of that, or the top of that lower left quadrant. That's uh, berth uh, 58, 59, and 60, 180,000 square feet of warehouse. If you continue to the right, you see the smaller building. That is also an historically significant building, given the theme of this meeting today. And that is a 45,000 square foot building. And the land that looks like an old tank farm is an old tank farm. That's the old Westways terminal that's also on our site. Warehouse one is not on our site. If you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So we're looking at the same, uh, the same overview of almost all of that 35 acres. The idea with Alta C at the Port of Los Angeles precedes me by several years. Uh, the uh, Annenberg Foundation and uh, particularly Len Abe, who, is, who has passed away tragically, uh, before my time, uh, actually came up with the idea working with the port uh, to uh, repurpose this portion of property, this city dock one, as a campus for ocean sustainability. And in the long building, the idea is to renovate this building and occupy it with startup businesses, incubated businesses, and accelerated businesses, and some established businesses that are in the ocean economy or the blue economy. Um, and um, I will come back to that in a moment. The building to the right, uh, just beyond that open area, is, the, uh, is to be the science center. We have a lease, uh, a, a prospective lease with uh, the Southern California Marine Institute, SCMI, is a consortium of 23 campuses and universities uh, that is in existence now. It operates on Terminal Island in a much smaller footprint on 6,000 square feet. It's a, it is made up of USC, UCLA, Occidental, the uh, uh, community college system, uh, the state college system. Uh, again, I'm gonna do a mic check here. How am I coming across? Can you hear me? Perfect. You're doing, you're doing oh, good. Okay, very good. And, um, and then you see the, um, the fallow land there, which is on our lease. And we have basically an option uh, uh, over the next 10 years to tell the port what we are going to do with it. Um, the idea, the concept is that you have a, a science center uh, where folks work together and it is immediately adjacent to a business center and they 
they um, accelerate and uh, collaborate with one another and you have technical transfer from the university space to the uh, business space. And then all of it is designed to incorporate uh, the, the immediate public and the broader public to uh, educate and inspire the next generations of scientists as well as, um, as, well as entrepreneurs. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is really an overview, and, and you can distribute this slot, these slides to, to the group. Uh, the idea is to is that we would be engaged in the long term in the the mitigation of environmental effects of climate change uh, by promoting uh, clean energy, carbon sequestration, uh, doing ocean restoration work, whether through, both through the universities and through the businesses. Uh, preserving the ocean for future generations through education, the blue workforce, creating these clean jobs for the future and innovation, and then uh, improving food security with offshore AmeriCulture and, and uh, um, uh, once through water aquaculture and urban aquaponics. aquaponics. Um, when we look at the 180,000 square foot building for new businesses, what we are focusing on is three different areas. One is uh, aquaculture or mariculture, which is essentially ocean farming, uh, creating opportunities to grow proteins uh, in the ocean that are sustainable and far more sustainable than terrestrial proteins like pigs and cows and chickens. And uh, right now we do have a tenant that pulled and is working the first uh, federal permit in the United States. The first permit in the United States is now only a handful of permits that have been issued, but ours was the first. And that is a company that's farming a thousand acres of mussels uh, offshore, uh, about eight miles off of uh, Huntington Beach. And that company is called Pacific Six. Next slide, please. This is a slide that we use in a number of our presentations. It's extraordinarily important for us as we're talking to funders and as we're talking to um, uh, you know, agencies that we're going to work with. We want to describe how we are aligned with the, uh, um, the sustainable development goals. Um, actually, can I move this? Yeah, our sustainable development goals um, at the international level. And as you can see, uh, operating at Alta C, we are focused on several of the sustainable development goals of education, affordable energy. And that's, you know, one of the one of the other business sectors that we're focused on is uh, offshore sustainable energies. And we have a couple of startup companies that are looking at uh, uh, wind, floating solar, but most importantly, most significantly right now, we have a company, um, a very small company, very small startup that's looking at uh, kinetic wave energy and battery capture. And it's all really in the early stages uh, and getting to market will take some time. Uh, we're looking at climate action, obviously, life below water, uh, life on the land, partnerships for all of these goals. These are all come out of the um, uh, the uh, International St um, Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide, please. Um, this is just uh, an example of focusing on um, the different types of technologies. And uh, uh, this, I'm going to actually ask you to go to the next slide. You can just distribute this. So here's what's really important, um, and this is this is some of the some of the news. This is not the most immediate news, but the really really good news is that it's been a long hard slog on getting the the uh, 180 thousand square foot uh, business center, which we call a center of innovation, underway. We have uh, 12 or 13 tenants in the building now, but the building is old and antiquated, as you might expect. It's a hundred year old building. Uh, doesn't have great power, doesn't have great sewer, doesn't have a, it's just, it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a good sturdy old building. And when we took it from the port, the estimate that the port gave us was that the renovation would cost about $15 million. And that's what we committed to in the lease. And that was what a lot of the uh, document was based on. When we got the bids back for the 180,000 square foot renovation, it came in at $43 million right at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. And so we went back to the drawing board and what we did is we negotiated with the, with the port to allow us to build each of the uh, structures one by one by one. And that would bring down the, 
the price and what the uh, bring down the, the the incremental costs. And we know that the first building, 58, that I, my offices are in, and that we have a handful of businesses in now, it would be about 12 to 15 million dollars. So we went back to the drawing board and we we got a grant this past year from the state of California, a straight grant for six million dollars as long as we had a match. And that was matched by the port in our lease the previ as previously negotiated. So we are right now doing the final value engineering on the 58 designs from uh, well, the first time I put out the RFP, or the first time I put out the bid package. And we expect to have it out in the first quarter of next year, which is, which is really, really great. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the exterior of this space of the, of the center of innovation. We have uh, about 4,000 linear feet a really good dock. Um, and in this space now, you see, even though this is a rendering, you see that uh, that ship uh, down below Bob Ballard, the, the sailor there. Uh, that's the um, that's Bob Ballard's uh, research vessel, the Nautilus. And it, it actually does make its home, its winter home um, at uh, Alta Sea at the Port of Los Angeles. And Bob Ballard has been a great partner of ours. Uh, and there's a lot of other tenants that are you know, eagerly uh, anticipating coming aboard as we get their innovation done because they want to be close to Bob Ballard. He's the scientist who discovered underwater explorer and has done a, bit, a good bit of science in and of himself and you know, in, in addition to his exploration. Next slide, please. We have a series of education programs that we're engaged in now, particularly during the pandemic. We just took the opportunity to go virtual. And so we've established a whole number of programs uh, that are, um, that are uh, at the high school level, live chats with um, all ages. Uh, we do podcasts. We have uh, curricula that, um, that we uh, use with LA Unified on, online uh, in the, um, uh, the program that they call the, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the program, but it's the kids working at home. And so we do a series of programs uh, now, and that's been uh, uh, sustaining us during the pandemic. Next uh, slide. This is a slide that I just used recently for uh, some funding requests, but I'm going to go to the next slide to hit some big news. Next slide, please. So this is the big news of this week. Um, as uh, with the Biden administration announcing what they called the Build Back Better EDA uh, regional uh, challenge, there was a billion dollars offered up uh, to be administered by the Economic Development Administration uh, and the EDA uh, put out the request for projects uh, across the country saying what they wanted to see was the, was the rebuilding of economies and emerging economies and opportunities for underserved communities. And uh, we partnered, we at Altasi reached out to um, the LAEDC, which is the Economic Development Corporation for the county and to UCLA and USC, believe it or not, through the, because we had the partnership with them already for the, um, for the university space um, and LACI downtown. And we put together this, this proposal uh, about two months ago, we put in a proposal for what essentially is a green economy and blue economy nexus. We know that there are opportunities to, uh, to use the resources of the ocean in a sustainable way through things like our aquaculture programs, our robotics programs, our, uh, our um, energy programs. And when they hit the dock, there are opportunities to take the goods and the services and create uh, green uh, programs that the port is already engaged in. And that's you know, advancing um, uh, sustainable energies in our in uh, harbor craft, water, uh, uh, land craft, uh, yard hustlers, and trucks. And so we put together this uh, pretty extensive program uh, and proposal uh, for the Build Back Better. And just two days ago, we were told that among the 500 applicants across the country, there were 60 awards uh, to go from what's called phase one to phase two, and we were one of those 60. 
uh, which means that we get um, we get five hundred thousand dollars from the EDA. Our whole group does to finish our application, and we have until March to complete the application to you know give it the rest of its flesh and put it submit it back in. And these uh, awards are worth between twenty five and uh, one hundred million dollars. That's the range we're looking for. Our application, we already know from working in our, our working group, will come in at about seventy million dollars. And of that $70 million, 28 of it is slated for construction at Altaseed, which would put us in a position that with that first $12 million I was just describing, we're moving forward with the renovation of 58. And with the value engineering that we've recently gone through, we know that with 28, 28 to $30 million, we would have the ability to finish 59 and 60 and have that full 180 thousand square foot complement of um, innovation and acceleration business space. So it's really, really exciting. We're going to be coming back to everybody, including we're going to be coming back to everybody, including the neighborhood council and all the business groups and, and um, everyone in town to get letters of support uh, by March as we get through this application. So next slide, please. So it's been a long, hard, exciting adventure at Alta C for me, particularly. Um, as you see, uh, we have this, we have all of the designs. We're finished with all of our environmental documentation. I have a lot of the uh, schematic designs as well as all of the building plans for a big chunk of this. Uh, and the, the difficult component of the last few years has been funding, but we are We've just come into a good, a significant amount of funding, and we have a great opportunity for the Build Back Better grant. And by the way, what I should say on the Build Back Better, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, jinx it or overstate it, but I will tell you this, that of the 500 applications, we were one of 60, and in the last round, the award will be to 30 different uh, projects. And so the EDA has already told us that half of those that are in round it made it to round two from round one, half of them will be funded. And while it's, while we shouldn't read too much into this, um, there uh, is only one application from Southern California that made it to round two. So if Southern California gets awarded, if it gets awarded, it'll be awarded to us. Uh, so that is the, that is the latest and the greatest on all to see. I, again, I apologize for the uh, quality of my of my internet connection, but I do appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Any questions? Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, we, we have a few questions. Um, Pat, Dave? Tim, how would you uh, view some kind of an association with a new Southern campus for the California Maritime Academy? Um, I've had several meetings with the Maritime Academy. Um, and I've gone up there and they've come down here and they have, uh, as you know, now they're doing, um, they have an engineering program. They have a new uh, uh, degree certification in engineering and they thought that it would make sense for them to somehow utilize some part of our campus. And they were thinking maybe even the, uh, the 17 acres of dirt over on the other side, you know, in, in the next phase. And that would okay. give us great opportunity to turn to the state since, as you know, that's part of the state college system. Mm. Great. Diana, mm. you had a question? Yeah, I, I had a question, Tim. I'm always trying to follow all the buildings. When you talk about the um, 75 or whatever it is, million, does that include the science center or the, the building that's no. actually on the corner, the one in the front, or no. only renovation of the other ones? Yeah, only yeah. The seventy million dollars will get divided between a bunch. If if we were to get it and again, yeah. I'm knocking on a piece of wood right now. <laughs> million dollars gets divided among a whole bunch of folks, and it would go into the only portion that would go to construction is about twenty eight million, and that would all go to the what I'll call the property. The it's interesting. To the, to the, to the what property? The the back of the property. The, back the of property. Okay. first fifty nine and sixty. Uh, it's really, uh, really glad you asked about the, the front building, though, because given this, given this significant investment by the state, you know, the state natural resources is putting in that $6 million. And that is, uh, I, have a, I have a sense that you, 
that we have a great argument to go back to the state in this next budget. Next budget is going to be very flush again. And so we've already begun the discussions to have the state fund the front building, not the, not the new construction, but the renovation of 57, which would be the science center. And the science center is extraordinarily expensive because you have labs and it comes in at, at $50 million rather conservatively um, because of the, the great weight of the building and the labs and the, and the seawater system. And so we're going back to the state to see you know, how much of that $50 million burden they can bear. The port is in for, the port is in for about $8 million on the seawall and I've raised about two and a half million dollars for the uh, for the entryway for the basically the the visitor portion uh, entrance of that of that building. Thank good great question though thank you. Um, Chuck, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, Tim, what are the, maybe I missed it? What are the buildings across the uh, across from the uh, the project? Where do you say across? What do you mean? At the top of the screen? Yes. The top of the screen, that's the fruit dock. So that is the, that's not ours. That's not on my lease, in other words. So that's port property and that's used as a fruit dock. And that's, uh, it's active during the winter time when fruits come up from uh, Central and South America. So it's still, it's still being used. They're still being used, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, I believe that's all the questions we have. Um, sounds like everything is really looking good for you guys uh, now to see um, Tim and we congratulate you on all the work you've done over the years. Um, we're definitely looking forward to seeing the progress and how it's shaping up. Um, Thank you. I, I, will, I will say, uh, I will say, that I like a lot of people, I've put my heart and soul into this, and it's I'm I'm going to continue to put my heart and soul into this no matter what job I have next year. Mm -hmm. and, and I really am grateful to the community for hanging in there with us. You know, we we adapted to the pandemic. We've we've come up with every, you know, every argument, every opportunity. We've turned over every rock and stone. I feel like Sisyphus pushing this rock, and we're finally getting to the crest of <laughs> I thank you very much for the uh, for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Tim. Um, and we look forward to seeing what future holds for you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to jump off and go back to my party. I'm really grateful for your time and for all of your service. And I'm going to join the chorus of people that are just so impressed that Emma uh, is protecting these great assets in our community, especially as as a new welcomed new contributor to the great community of so thank you emma thank you so much thank right. you and enjoy bye -bye. your party thanks bye bye guys thank bye. you bye very good um well that was great great news um we've been following up on that as it's been growing and it's great to see that it's finally shaping up and it's gonna be something that we really will be proud of uh, here in town and then in the whole area. Uh, personally, it's one of my favorite projects in, in, in this whole town. So <laughs> um, let's see, we're going to move on to um, item number four on the agenda, which is uh, consider a motion related to transportation demand management plan by Dan Dixon. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Thanks a lot. I, uh, I, I come into this tonight humbly, especially in, fa in light of following uh, Emma's presentation about Walker's Cafe. I am in awe. Well, I greatly admire the research that she has done. And I love her love of the history of San Pedro, which she shares with many of us. Uh, I'm also uh, Delighted to hear Tim McOsker's report on Alta C. It's the first time I had heard that, that presentation. And so in the first two items tonight, we've uh, delved into San Pedro's past <laughs> and the love we have for it. And we've gotten a glimpse into San Pedro's future. 
both of them are fascinating and both of them are um, worthy of our time and consideration and care. But I'm here to talk about parking. <laughs> <Which Sorry. one? laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a downer uh, in more ways than one. Uh, I'm here to present uh, a position that we would like to take with the city planning department in reference, this is in reference to the revision of the transportation demand management guidelines is, which is uh, connected to and ultimately part of the mobility 2035 plan, the whole scheme to keep Los Angeles moving in the eyes of our city fathers and mothers. Uh, it is a huge document and there are many things which will ultimately impact us, but the most immediate impact, as so often as the case comes back to the, can, the uh, impact on our little neighborhoods here in San Pedro, our, our balanced new and old and middle-aged neighborhoods, which each has their own individual challenges and opportunities. But we are concerned about in particular, two sections of the guidelines which refer to parking. And uh, the letter effectively asks planning to remove two sections, two relatively innocuous appearing sections from the uh, guidelines that they're proposing. They both reference parking. It is clear to everyone who lives here in town that traffic is awful and parking is a challenge. It's also clear here in San Pedro that as far as we know, we are part of no grand scheme or even medium, medium scheme to improve transport, public transportation in our area. Uh, the city envisions a metropolis of people who walk, who bike, who take public transportation, who ride trains, uh, who ride hoverboards, whatever whatever you can imagine to get around. Uh, frankly, most of us here in town know that you gotta drive, have a car to drive somewhere to either engage in commerce or go to work or recreation. That will change. It will change in a manner we almost can't even predict. Well, we know we can't predict uh -oh, it Danny because froze. it's in flux. Uh, it's, it's definitely happening. Uh, but we do not want to be left in the back in the in the backwater, the backwash of all this progress, by and be forced into uh, an untenable position in terms of our neighborhoods. The uh, point that there will be a point system developed uh, to permit certain uh, certain size developments and types of developments uh, in terms of what they contribute to or do not contribute to mobility within the city. Uh, as new apartments and condominiums and businesses are added out in our neighborhoods and you can begin to see how this begins to connect to AB9, as these things begin to occur, the question for us becomes, what happens to us? Where do we park? And the two area, the two items of concern are, of course, I've lost one here. Um, oh yeah, in the parking section, part one and part five. Part one talks about unbundling parking uh, fees from uh, from rentals and leases of residential property apartments and, and condominiums, uh, effectively throwing the homeowners or renters uh, into the open market for the cost, uh, increased cost of parking. Item five is even more ominous, and that is simply a reduction in parking supply below the generalized citywide parking baseline using parking reduction mechanisms, including but not limited to uh, tra transit opportunity centers, density bonuses, bicycle parking, parking ordinances, 
locating in an enterprise zone or whatever. There are a lot of, there's a lot of stuff there and those are their words, but the bottom line is as new properties are developed or changed or their characters changed, they can get rid of parking. And our, uh, our one section of our letter here talks about the fact that San Pedro is an older community. The streets were built before a lot of modern transit opportunities. The streets are narrow, they get crowded and they are primarily residential, both apartments and single family residences. And to reduce parking in these neighborhoods by whatever means or for whatever reason is simply a, a, a very difficult uh, inconvenience for we in the communities. And given the fact that there's really no plan at all to improve mass transit in our area or any kind of differential use uh, transportation, it's un we believe it's unacceptable. And we are asking at the end of the letter to, we are recommending that the guidelines be changed to not allow either of those two parking strategies in older neighborhoods, unless they are eligible as transit opportunity centers. So we believe that uh, any area in the city with substandard streets, in terms of width and capacity and ability for traffic to, to proceed, uh, be, that would be a good descriptor of areas that should be left out of this, this, uh, these parking changes at the moment. So the letter is asking us to, is asking the planning department to remove San Pedro and by extension, other neighborhoods from the burdens of these two uh, parking, parking plans. So I will, I will take that, Dan, as a motion on your part for no. Northwest. <laughs> If I were in a Northwest meeting, I would have been stopped 10 minutes ago and told to shut up because I hadn't put it in the form of a motion. So <laughs> Alex, 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 I'll put it in the form of a motion. I move that we accept this letter uh, requesting that certain elements of the uh, of the transformation, transportation demand management guidelines be removed. They are listed in the in the motion. Thank you. So is there from Linda Alexander seconded it. Thank so you. Now, we'll, now we'll open up to questions, comments. Yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna admit I'm not very knowledgeable on the on the plan myself. Um, I haven't read it all up, so I will need to understand it better and then understand the letter how that that comes um so probably what we'll do is we'll bring it up to the um our committee meeting the next month um pat has his hand up yeah i just uh i have a comment you know for years we've been hammering the city for using um inadequate uh, transportation engineering um statistics to underestimate the amount of traffic that would be generated by uh, projects around the city. And it seems now the city's response is, well, we got a problem, we got too much traffic, let's just eliminate cars. <laughs> it seems yeah. to me to be kind of a shallow response to me. That, that is cor correct, that transportation demand management changes the whole way that traffic is measured and uh, calculated, uh, it, it no longer, it looks at the viability of individual intersections. It's all about uh, miles traveled from point to point. It, it does not connect at all to the individual driving experience. And that is, that is the ultimate goal of the city. As Pat just said, get us out of our cars. That's fine, but we do believe we need options uh, we need to work hand in hand with the city to uh, see options developed as alternatives to vehicles. 
Doug Epperhard? Yeah, I'm very disappointed because I was going to trade my car in for a unicorn, but if I'm not <laughs> going to have a place to keep it, um, I'm just incredibly disappointed. You know, I got to tell you, this is like everything else the city does. They make plans and what difference does it make because every developer comes along and says, oh, here are 18 loopholes that allow me to build 150 units and provide three parking spaces as long as there's a bus stop within three miles. Um, you know, good luck with it. <laughs> I just, I, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at my little R1 residential neighborhood and the number of ADUs that are suddenly being mm -hmm. um, asked for. And I look out my window at the neighbors who have a one car garage, because this is a post-World War II neighborhood where nobody had more than one car. Yep. So they got one or two more cars out on the street. And um, okay, good luck to all of us. Uh, let's see. The, the, the threat, <laughs> okay. sorry, excuse me. Jason, you got a question? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm also not too familiar with um, the guideline, the entire document, or the depth and descriptions in detail of, of strategy one and five. So, I mean, I I think I'd like to be more educated on that before taking a vote on this. Um, in my opinion, um, but in in general, we should use this, I think, not to say, hey, let's keep our parking or more parking but as a you know, way forward to demand more transportation. So rather than like, whoa, 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 let's stop progress and don't do things. Let's, hey, hey, let's use this as a positive to get our transportation that we all want justified as opposed to just trying to, to stop things. So I, I would wanna take that approach on handling the problems we have resulting from this document. I would agree with that, Jason. Um, Anybody else has any? Hey, North, Northwest has a, a motion on the floor. So if there's no other comments, then I will take a vote from Northwest. Um, Linda? Yes. And Diane is a yes. Dan? Yes. Uh, Pat and Abe? Pat Nave. Got a point of order. I, I want to make a motion to table. Second. Motion to table takes precedence. All right. Yep. Table. Yes. So then we take a vote on how many people want to table it. So then I've got to call the roll on that, which should be Linda. Okay. Is it voting to table? Yes, that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, Dan. Um, <laughs> I'll go with the group. Uh, yes. Table. Okay. Pat. Yes. Chuck. Well, why are we having a motion to the table? What, what's the uh, what's the concern? All right. My concern is uh, the concern is raised by uh, Jason to um, con consider and discuss a little more of the how we use this as a as a um a method to get uh, better transportation resources allocated to us oh uh, okay yes <laughs> um jason yes alec yes and diana and i won't know but it passes Seven to seven, yes, one no. I I would charge you, Pat and Jason, to go look at the letter and see how you want to amend it um, so that we can go back and, and, and act on this before the city, before it's too late to get our input into the city. When does is, when is that come up? We don't have the deadline yet. Otherwise I'd be yelling and screaming about the deadline, but knowing that you know it takes us time to meet and act and then get to our board. I just want to make sure that we act as soon as we can on it. 
we'd, we'd want to get there by January the 10th, because that's our board meeting, right? That's our board meeting, and we, are, we will not be meeting again before January the 10th as a, as a committee, unless it's specifically to look at this January. No, our next meeting, even if we did our next regular meeting, it wouldn't be till January the 12th. So we do a special meeting, I suppose, but. Well, just as long as we do it by early January, if you and Jason could come back with something, then we'll, we'll, we'll have it. If we can do it to our February board meeting, I think we're okay. But I don't want to see it go much further than that. No, I, I agree. It would automatically carry, this is a joint planning meeting. So if it's on a table, where does it automatically go? Does it go on to? You, we just uh, tabled it for Northwest. Okay. So You're tabling be, just affected Northwest. So it's, it'll be yeah. on the off agenda. And Central is going to take it back to the committee, so maybe we can collaborate on that later. Yeah. And you've got two, two other hands up, Chuck and Doug. And Chuck? Uh, Go ahead, there's Chuck. There's no reason for hesitation and to vote on that. Um, sometimes we dig a hole we can't get out of. So anyway, just my additional comment on that. Move forward as soon as we can. Okay. Very good. I, I think that was it, Diana. Yeah, Doug took this down. Yeah. Very well. Uh, we'll move on to item five, um, which is uh, consider the CIS in support of Council File 21 1414, the SB9 implementation, and letter to. Council President Nori Martinez, um, Diana. Yeah, um, this is kind of an, a, a, a time sensitive measure. It was passed um, by Northwest Board already and I, it's on the agenda already for Coastal, but I decided to go ahead and bring it up even after I found that out because maybe, maybe Central wants to act on it tonight and, and that would be the reason for bringing it up now. Um, you remember that SB9 is the new law that mandates local jurisdictions to allow an applicant to split a lot in two and then construct two houses on each half. And if ADUs are allowed an ADU on each half resulting in as many as six units on a lot currently zoned for one house. The legislation did however, have some areas in which it allowed the city to, to impose some very limited regulations. So there is a city council motion pending that would put in place most of the allowable restrictions on such lot splits. If the city does not act on the motion um, by January 1st, SB 9 will take effect in the city of LA without those, those restrictions. Uh, so up to now, council president has not scheduled the motion for action. And so just to give you some of the things the motion would do is it would allow the city to impose objective zoning standards. It would say that this is another thing that's allowed under the law, you could outlaw ADUs on the, on the lot split. And so this would say you could not have any additional units such as ADUs or further lot, lot splits after the initial lot split. So that would mean a maximum of four rather than a maximum of six units. It would require off street parking on one space per unit, unless it's within a quarter mile of high quality transit. Um, if you don't, if, if they don't do that, they would not be required to have any off street parking. And it would require four foot setbacks. Otherwise, without the city doing something, there would be no setbacks required. And they would require an affidavit confirming that the applicant intends to reside in one of the units for at least three years. So that's basically the restrictions that would be imposed if this council file council motion passes. Then because there's not time to adopt an ordinance, this would be implemented by a memorandum to all relevant departments and agencies as an interim measure until such time as an ordinance can be developed and passed. And we would then have the opportunity to provide additional comment on the ordinance um, as it's being drafted. So I would urge Javier, 
if, if possible, that your committee act on this, since you, and then you could get it on your board agenda for your upcoming board meeting. Um, otherwise, the time the clock is ticking. Uh, do you want to? Do you want to, someone to put it up on the screen so you can see it? Um, no, I I have it uh, myself. Um, it's a very simple. Yeah, function. yeah. And we wouldn't be able to take it to this next board meeting because we already had the agenda setting meeting uh, yesterday. And you have no provision for an emergency if we're adding something after the agenda setting meeting if it's time sensitive. Uh, no. Linda, do we have anything like that? No, and uh, but <laughs> I I wish you'd said that a month ago, but. Uh, <laughs> Good idea. Do you have something like that in Northwest, Diane? Oh yeah. Yeah. Gee, we yeah. don't. I had never even heard of such darn. Yeah. No. Well, you then there's no there's no reason for you to act on this tonight if you can't take it to your next board meeting anyway. So when, when's your next board meeting? Next Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. You could do a special meeting in addition to your regular meeting. We'd have to have a special meeting of the board. Yeah. You can do it at the same. You can do it at the same time. You just do it. Right before or right after. It's a special oh, agenda oh, setting oh, committee. Oh, okay. Have to okay. I got okay. I I all right, we can do that. We have time we have time to post a special meeting. And we've done it before in Central too. Uh, several years ago we did one. Yeah. So okay. if I can have if I can uh, arrange that uh, tomorrow if uh, somebody send me that letter. Okay. Should we vote on this, Javier, that we want Yes, to yes. Can I get a motion on it? I so move that we have a special meeting to present uh, this letter for approval to the Central Neighborhood Board. I second it. Great. Um, so I'll take a vote, uh, Frank. Yes. Linda? Yep. And myself, yes. OK, great. Very good. Anna, you could send me that letter. Sure. Yeah, and so I'll I'll put that special meeting together. Yeah, it, it's on the website with the um um the material for, the for tonight. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. I actually sent it to you already. Come to think of it for tonight's right. meeting. That's right. I got it. Okay. Okay. Very good. good. Um anything else on that, Diana? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Mm. Very good. We'll move on to item number six. Um, consider a letter to recreation and parks regarding reopening the cafe in Point Furman Park. Jason. Oh, that was supposed to be removed from the uh, agenda. So we don't we don't do that. No, I'm going to put together a larger presentation with all the parks, not just. One okay. Park. Very well. We'll move. To next item, which is uh, seven housing element of the general plan, Diana. You know, this is something that Robin specifically asked me to address, and there were a couple items she wanted me to talk about, and she's not here, so I'm not. I'm inclined to put that over, except for one piece of it, which is to, to have Jason show you the interactive map that he has done. Um, you may recall that in the. Uh, in, in, in the plan, the, the, the plan has earmarked um, a number of properties in San Pedro to be potentially upzoned. And Jason put together a map that shows where those properties are. And so I asked him to share that. So why don't, why don't we go ahead and share that, um, Jason? Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> Half hour town. Good heavens. And they're up zoned. What does that mean? Well, different there's a variety of different things that they're they are doing. Some of them could be uh, like in my neighborhood, our property, what they are, what the recommendation is, is that we be allowed by right to have two ADUs rather than just one on our property. Oh, um, oh. In some cases, it's multiple, making it so you could have multiple units. It may be mixed use. Um, they have a variety of strategies. Wow. And there's a list of, of the 
So I, I could show you the list of strategies in a minute. Um, Jason, click on one of these and show us what your map does. <laughs> Aha, uh -huh. so here you, at the top, it shows it was one in my neighborhood. Um, so, 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 current. Jason, did you put all these little buttons everywhere? <laughs> That's very impressive. <laughs> and so if you go down to the bottom, I think that's where, so the rezoning here, for theirs would be ADU, that is the ADU code means they could allow a, a second ADU. A that's second one. A second one. That's what that's what's recommended for that site. Would be wow. that particular address. Choose another one so we could just see um, in another neighborhood. See what that one is. <coughs> this one's on Summerland. And go down to the bottom. And this one is would now be more density at art. R2 RD, and I can't tell you exactly what how much density, but that would that would allow for for more unit for more units there than just a single family and what's currently a single family. So Is that max, maximum density allowed 36. 36 what? 36 units per I believe acre. per acre. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so sit, currently it's zoned single family residence, but R2 RD is, is multiple family. Oh. So that would be recommended for that particular parcel. Now, yeah, as I said, they have different strategies for different parcels. In Mancho Palos Verdes, all of Western Avenue that is in Western Palos Verdes, all of it is recommended for mixed use, potentially. Now, this is all identified as potential. And you may recall that potential doesn't mean actual. The city will have three years to decide what actually gets rezoned. And the suggestion is that we may want to look and say, where are we willing to have rezoning? What are the areas where, where it's more acceptable and where is the areas where it's le less acceptable? Um, but this, and, and I think each, each of the three committees may separately want to look at their area and may want to look at what's recommended in their area. And I see Dan's hand up. Diana, it, I noticed that my little cul-de-sac is one of the few that doesn't have any blue dots. Is that, I, I'm assuming that without a blue dot, that doesn't mean you can't do an ADU. This, these dots are about exceeding yes. the rules. Yes. The, the current rules, okay. Yes, they're about changing the current zoning. Okay. I assume in our case, our lots are too small and our parking is too crappy. Thank you. Well, <laughs> and this is in addition to SB9 that allows you to do these lot splits. It, in, this is separate from, from all that, right? Yes. And one of the comments that we made at the time to the city was they needed to look at SB9 and the, and the impact of that. And I think it's a comment we have to continue to, to make because SB9 would certainly increase the availability, potentially increase the availability of housing without some of the zoning changes. So that's what we have to look right. at as we go forward. Right. The, if you want to look at, so you look at properties on this map, you can also look at properties because we have the whole list um, in on our website. And maybe, Jason, do you want to show the list of properties? Yeah. So here it is um, listed by, by um, street address. So you can, you can look at that and, and see what's being recommended. And the recommendations on this chart are at the far right-hand side. So it goes from... Applicable rezoning programs. So this, this shows what they're suggesting. The ones that say ADU or, or an additional ADU, the R2, RD is increased density. I've forgotten what the DB, DB density bonus. 
Oh, that's increased density <laughs> bonus. So that's 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 yeah, here's the rezoning codes. The DB50 is a 50% density bonus. Um, the R2, RD are two ADUs on sites with existing multifamily. Hmm. Uh, I want a parking bonus. <laughs> so anyway, I encourage you to take a much closer look at this um, in the next month or two. And I see Pat Nave and Dan Dixon both have their hands up. Pat? You're muted, Pat. Where can we get this document online? It's on the Northwest San Pedro Neighborhood Council website. And when I put out the, um, it's on the planning page under um, the plan to house LA. And when I put out the notes of this meeting, I'll put the link in there. Thank you. Doug, do you have a question or a comment? No, I do have a comment. Looking at all those blue dots, I'm thinking we should change the name of San Pedro to Baja Ponte Vista. Um, <laughs> I, when this first was available, I took a look at my street, for instance. And yeah, I mean, it's just, you look at all those dots. I haven't looked at numbers lately, but there are approximately 30 thousand, I believe, dwelling units in San Pedro. Now that includes a lot of multifamily units and whatnot, but we do have significant areas of R1. Um, you know, if there are 5,000, let's say, R1 units each available for a minimum of at least one additional ADU, I mean, you could see a significant boost in San Pedro's population. Mm -hmm. One that theoretically would make Ponte Vista look like chump change. Um, <clears throat> given the fact that we are in a significant drought, given the fact that down at my end of town, a lot of the territory is geologically unstable. Um, given the traffic and parking issues, Things could get really interesting around here. So yeah, whatever we can do, we should do. Yeah. Well, and that's also assuming that everybody is willing to do that because just because it's possible, it doesn't mean it will happen. Well, I, I will tell you based on the ADU applications that are starting to pop up in Coastal, including one right around the corner from me, they're gonna accelerate. I mean, we're going to see, I would, I would guess within the next two to three years, we're going to see a few hundred, at least, here in San Pedro. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily disagree. I, I think a lot of the ADUs also are being converted for, um, you know, extended family, like elders. And I think that serves a really good purpose. Uh, which in that case, no, no additional parking. It, it does, but I have to tell you, I have more than one neighbor I've had discussions with who are saying, you know, I got plenty of room for an ADU and I wouldn't mind the income. True. Yeah. True. Yeah, uh, true. Well. Wait till they find out how expensive it is to buy and build a little ADU. <laughs> They may change their mind. Yeah, a friend of mine got a quote for almost a hundred thousand dollars, and they stopped their plans real quick. Yeah, I'm wow. seeing, yeah, that much and more average. Well, well <clears throat> this is a really good map, uh, Jason. Definitely, I'll have to explore it. You've got a couple more hands, Javier. Uh, let's see, Adele. Yes, um, you know, I'm just am feeling a lot of doom and gloom, but I bought a house, a pricey house across the street from a large apartment building and a smaller apartment building and multiple condos all lined up. 
And it really isn't the end of the world. If everyone in the apartment building who does have enclosed garages would park in the <laughs> garage, I know I always bring this up, but instead of oh. on the street, it would free up some parking. So maybe we should have a community drive effort, something mm -hmm. spearheaded by the neighborhood council or maybe in, in cahoots with the CD15 and ask people, hey, we're having a new storage unit coming into San Pedro. Put your stuff in there and park your car in your garage. And it'll be a nice, fresh, clean car, not subjected to all of the salt and wind and stuff that we have in the coastal communities in San Pedro. So, and you know, and, you know and, it's not doom and gloom living in a mixed residential area. That's all. If you've got the extra room for an ADU, they might want to consider, you know, taking stuff out of the garage and building, I don't know, a shed. Well, remember, you do not have it's a little to cheaper. <laughs> rent out your ADU. And, and as the people in Coastal know, I was uh, tasked to examining some of the applicants for the ADU. And the majority were for units that were already illegally used as rentals. They couldn't get the permits. But most of them were rentals. And because they had to now go by the uh, building and safety code, they're really a much safer dwelling than it was before. Yeah, <laughs> I will agree. I've, I've had to process a few of those where they're legalizing rather than yeah, adding. Yeah, a lot. Um, Pat, do you have a comment? Yes, I do. Uh, is there going to be a CEQA analysis of this before the um, final plan is adopted? That was already done, Pat. For the for the for what for, for the, for the, the, the plan the gen the, the the housing update in the general plan had a sequel analysis already for the entire city for the entire city mm -hmm. and wasn't also something from the state that was requiring to up zone some areas that we were talking about the the state required the city in its general plan to show how it had space for about 450,000 additional units. And there were about 200 and some odd that they gave credit for of things that were already on uh, space that was already there, zoning that was already allowed. Um, and then, so the city has to find another 200 and about 60, 270 thousand um, potential units. And that's what this is about. Oh. Okay. And that's units that meet all the requirements of the state, which are, <laughs> they have a lot of requirements and what, 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 what they actually will recognize. Very good. That's why I say we have to look and try to figure out where of all of this, what what is the accept where 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 is it acceptable and what parts are we willing to say okay this we can live with right and this is the part that we just really can't live with uh yeah no i agree i agree with that um, um you know i don't know how they do in um places like uh pasadena which has no overnight parking allowed um where people put their cars at night um, but yeah, no, it, it's definitely a, an issue here. So we'll take a look at that. Um, and this is an ongoing um, process, Diana. The, is there any time frame the, that we need to look at? The city has three years to actually make zoning changes. So okay. But what's in the um, uh, housing element uh, supposed to be updated? No. Yeah, this is the, up yeah, the update had to identify, which is what they've done, the ones that would potentially be changed. Okay. And now they have three years to actually make changes and they don't all have, they've identified more than they need. There's, there's excess and they don't need all of the blue dots that are in here. Right, right. Yeah, so, it's just the possible. Yeah. 
Okay, that makes sense. Um, do we still have a question, Mona? Are you there? Uh, she needs to be allowed to talk. Ah, okay. Mona, are you there? Yeah, I am here. Um, I, I would appreciate knowing under what tab or what heading uh, you have this map on the Northwest um, Neighborhood uh, Council page. I, it's I on the plan First of all, it's on the Planning Committee page. Right. There's a heading called um, Plan to House Los Plan to House LA. Okay. And under that heading, um, it's just about the last tab under that heading, but I will put in the notes of this meeting the exact link. Okay. And Mona, I'll try to remember to send you the notes. Yeah. Um, I, but if I don't, just I'll holler. Okay. Holler. I, I think Frank and I would like to pass this on to people that we know and you know through the historical society. And and I think at, at a previous meeting I did um uh, voice my concerns about the coastal area uh, for some of the, I think it was Doug who also mentioned issues with land stability. Mm -hmm. so I hope we can look at that. Yeah, those are exactly the kinds of things we should start identifying and, and recording. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Very good. Um, let's see, any further questions, comments? I don't see any. Anything else, Diana? Not on that. Okay, um, then we'll move on to the next item, which is up to some other items of interest to the committee. Um, that's you, Diana. <laughs> the, the big update is that Axel has accepted another job within the city. He's going to be starting at the new youth development department this next Monday. Twice why he's not here tonight, because he was having a, an exit meeting from his current job. Um, so that's really a big loss for us, particularly because it appears that the council office may not refill that position, which means all of the planning projects are just going to be split among existing staff. He thinks hmm. the larger projects will go to Allison Becker, who's great, but she's so busy that it's hard to get in touch with her. And um, that Ryan will handle the smaller projects, but they may be split up in other ways in the office. He's really not sure. Um, second thing is on the connectivity plan, RFP, the port received 10 responses. They're going to be reviewing them and anticipate selecting a successful bidder in February and then having a contract in place sometime in March. So in terms of meeting, you know, being prepared to meet with the contractor, it would probably be late March, early April, I would think, from, based on that. Um, most of the other projects, the status is about the same. The street furniture program went to the Board of Public Works today. They considered an extension of the existing contract for one year, which is good news because it will give time then to go back and really look more thoroughly at what was being proposed and what some of the concerns are on it. Um, but in looking at the council file, I noticed there was not a CIS from either central or coastal I was sure that, that Coastal had passed one, but I do not see it in the council file. So you may want to take a look, um, Doug, or somebody may want to take a look, on, look at that. Hmm, that's interesting because we did um, you pass passed that at, at the board meeting. Well, it looks like it didn't get filed. Okay, maybe. Diana, is this on the street furniture thing? Yes. It's on our agenda for Monday. Oh, okay. Maybe no. Yeah, I thought you passed one a long time ago. Maybe not. Okay. No, I'm pretty sure it's that's the same thing because it's a one year extension. Right, but the the actual council file we we commented on several months ago on some of the the concerns. But okay, that may have been done. I I'll check with Robin because she yeah she generally files those. Oh, okay. Um, I don't I don't do CISs. The chairs do them. And if you're talking about the extension being on your agenda for Monday, that, yeah, okay. So that would have passed today from the, the Board of Public Works. Um, the courthouse, construction of the courthouse has been delayed a couple of months. They now are expected to start in January or February. I don't know what the delay was, but not surprising. Everything seems to always get delayed. Um, Beacon's Landing, interestingly enough, that proposed project 
just got a $2 million um, infrastructure grant from the state. And so I've reached out to them to see if they'd come and tell us what they plan to do with it because infrastructure is for things around the project, not for the actual construction of the project itself. Ooh. Interesting grants. So what landing? Beacon's Beacon. Landing. That's the one down on Beak that would be on Beacon Street where the warehouses are now um, over kind of what's a 300 block of Beacon Street. And oh. It's a 100% um, supportive service, 100% affordable with, with on-site supportive services being built by Abode. But they haven't answered my, my email, so I'm not quite sure why. That was it on updates. Um, related to Beacon, uh, Beacon House looks like it's um, starting construction um, for by a few days. And it looks like it's moving forward, so that's great news. Yeah, they're supposed to be having a, a groundbreaking sometime soon, but we haven't been given a date. Diana, could I just say that this afternoon I drove down uh, Harbor Boulevard and noticed that they are taking up the red car tracks where they're going to be putting in the new park or, new park. or whatever it is, but they're taking up the tracks right now. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Not happy well, about that. Yeah. I'll stay on mute. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's that's the end of my report. Okay. Um anybody else has anything they would like to contribute? Um Otherwise, um, public comment. Public comment on items not on the agenda is. Alan, you're muted. How's that? That Good. sounds great. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. this this is a <clears throat> a belated follow up comment actually on the SB9 discussion, which I, I think comes from a, a little bit different point of view that uh, I that hope people would consider. Um, it, to my eye, the, the plan, uh, I, I commend uh, the, the wonderful map that Jason has made that, that really helps to visualize what they have in mind. But to, to my eye, it, it looks really like a blueprint for living indoors, uh, mm. for, for, for an architectural world for people to live in. Um, I think many neighborhoods in San Pedro, much of their appeal is green space. And access to green space is something that, that is a tradition of San Pedro. So, it's ironic to me in a, in a meeting where we had a, an extended discussion of Walker's Cafe and its historic significance. I think green space plays a, a much bigger role in people's lives uh, on a daily basis. I mean, how many people go in, who live in San Pedro go to Walker's every week, every month, even every year? But people are accustomed to seeing green space, to having plants and birds, butterflies and things like that. And that that densification pretty much rules out that, that facet of the life that many of us find attractive. And I'm afraid that uh, it would cause uh, an accelerating loss. It once, once the neighborhood started to go, it would set a, a, a move uh, for people who like that kind of neighborhood, uh, unless it was done with, with real uh, sensitivity to the nature of the community. That's it. Um, while I've got the, the microphone, I'd just like to thank everybody uh, for the work they do on this committee and in other projects, organizations they're involved with around town. Um, San Pedro is a special place and it's people like you that put in the time uh, that make it a special place. So happy new year. Yeah. <laughs>
Thanks, Alan. Chuck? Yeah, they speak with forked tongue. I'm sorry. <laughs> they speak with forked tongue. They want to do away with the greenhouse gases and they add more cars. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Let's see, and uh, anyone else? Yeah, Lou has his hand up. Oh, Lou, um, our president of uh, Central um, Network there. Council. Hi, thanks, uh, Javier and Diana and everybody. I just wanted to say hi and uh, great presentations by everybody. I caught most of them, just the tail end of Emma's though, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I just wanted to do a general public comment because um, if you care about Central having a neighborhood council, you might want to come to our next meeting. Um, unfortunately, we have a committee that is trying to um, basically take over the board or undermine the board. And um, <clears throat> ever since Frank retired from the, the port committee, the port committee has kind of gone rogue with its new chair and its agendas are have gotten so absurd that um, we can't even post our agenda. That's the latest thing today, actually. The Department of Neighborhood Empowerment said we can't even post the agenda because it will probably need to have items from the port committee taken off at the insistence of the city attorney's office. So that's how bad it's gotten. And we have a lot of new people that don't know the history of San Pedro, that don't know the politics of the area, that don't know the history of the people involved. And if they did, they might be less... Uh, trusting of some of the information they're getting from the port chair and um, a lot more rational about handling these things. So hopefully it will just be a brief wrap up meeting on Tuesday for some year end reports and some, um, you know, well wishing for the holidays, but it's possible that there could be some other um, silly discussions that go on that have nothing to do with helping the neighborhood. So if you want to stop by and comment and encourage us as we are needed to be encouraged sometimes to stay on task and focus on issues instead of uh, personalities and attacking one another, then that would be very helpful. You're always welcome, but I just wanted to extend that special invitation tonight if you want to drop by Tuesday evening at 630. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Lou. And um, uh, it's unfortunate because um, I, I witnessed some of that um, and we'll definitely be there. I'll bring my safety goggles, but um, <laughs> I, I hope everything goes well. We um, had such a great meeting last month. It was just so civil and pleasant. Yeah, well, you know, and, and I wish everybody could see that and we get a lot more accomplished um, doing that. So. Uh, I just hope everybody would use um, best intentions. Emma? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to circle back on uh, uh, coastal voting on my letter and what the next steps are with that, given that the uh, coastal planning and land use chair wasn't able to attend tonight. Um, I guess they'll take it back to their committee. Would you like me to answer that? Please, Doug. Okay. Yes, that will go to public parks and coastline since it's right there next to Noah's house. Um, and then I would guess it will come to us for a vote in January. We have the agendas out for this month, and our meeting is Monday. So that would be the schedule, I believe, for those things. So in terms of, you said it's now, go, it, it would be referred now to another committee instead of land use, in addition to land use? I'm just want to make sure I'm getting this right. Well, I don't, I would have to go back. I wasn't at the land use meeting this last Saturday. I don't know if they took it off. I don't uh, believe it came up. I don't okay. think so. All right, okay. And there was no parks committee, so it will go to one or the other or both for next month. And you'll let Emma know. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it, it's 
for sure. Now, I know there was an email we emailed the other day, and Noel, I think, emailed you back with some stuff. So, yeah, he said he, he did say he wanted to take it up in parks as well. I'm just okay. I'm just thinking about does that then mean that discussing it in the coastal board meeting would roll over into February? No, in January. No, no, okay. no, no. It would. Uh, they would. They. We meet the third Monday. Their meetings would be prior to ours. Our board meetings. Okay. So whatever motion they come up with would be probably for our January agenda. And I'm looking at my calendar right now to see if I can give you that date. In January, we will. We actually do not meet on the third Monday in January because of Martin Luther King Day. So we'll be meeting the following Tuesday, which is the same night as Central. <laughs> I oh just okay. realized. Oh boy. Yeah, but. I will have to try to split myself in half. <laughs> well, you know, actually, yeah, and we can arrange a time certain for that so we can tell you be here at, you know. That would, yeah, that would be good because, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, you know, it's obviously Walkers is in coastal. It's it's directly relevant to your community, and I would definitely like to be there for it. Yes, and like I say, yeah. we, can, we can arrange it for you so that we can say be here at this time and we'll take it up right now. Okay, we'll sounds try great. really hard to accommodate that for you. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Pat. Yeah, Lou, I'm on your uh, central um, calendar webpage and, I, and I'm not finding a link uh, to tap into your uh, to your meeting on Tuesday. You're not finding a link, you said? I'm not finding a link there. Let me uh, yeah, we haven't posted the agenda yet. We we will. Um, usually we do on Saturday. We still have to hear back from Dunn and the city attorney about a couple of things, but um, we sh we'll have it posted on Saturday. And okay. I did hear the part about doing a special meeting, possibly like 10 or 15 minutes before. Yeah, we have done that before. That's a possibility. And regarding the special meeting about redistricting, we almost did one, um, but it was going to be probably after the uh, committee met anyways, the redistricting committee. So I was like, and my thinking was, it's gonna be late anyways, let's just save it for the regular meeting. Um, so that is on the agenda. I just emailed a couple of people today, what was uh, proposed the language wise. Thank you. Yep. Very good. Um, let's see any, Further comments um, from anyone else? Um, I move to adjourn. I will. Two hours. <laughs> I will second that. Well, um, just uh, want to wish everybody a happy holidays and um, hope everybody has a good um, rest of the year. And we will be seeing you uh, back on January 26th for our next joint meeting. Look at look at Jason's background. He has a new background. <laughs> Very cool. I love it. Where where is Jason's heart? <laughs> you can see. That is great. I'm passionate about it. Eh? Hey, Very good. For this sign, do you want me to throw myself across the track? She's supposed to help. <laughs> they just run over me. I'm sure. <laughs> Hey, Very good, up. guys. Yeah. They, would, they, would, they would cave right over you. Hey, Lou, stay on a minute. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Good night. Thanks, Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Good <laughs> Lou, I was just checking with you.